Ladies and gentlemen, I'm playing with Chunk again. This time something very old. I guess it's probably from the 1960s, eventually even back to the 1940s. I don't know, I haven't found much information. It's a nice looking device made in Switzerland by Hasler company in Bern. Uh, it says Tell. has nothing to do with William Tell. That guy writes his name with two L's. Um, I don't know what the abbreviation means. I just know all these Tell meters are named Tell and I remember them uh, used in, uh, in in trams in the city of Zurich in old tramways trams um, for uh, indicating the speed and I remember when you looked into the cockpit uh, you saw this thing and it was always ticking like that indicating something here so this one does not indicate speed it's a uh, tachometer you can see here I'm turning the shaft here and the, the uh, faster I turn the higher the needle gets so of course this is I think 2000 rpm one full revolution here so let's simulate that with my uh, cordless drill here let's see how high we can get 200 500 well 1200 and it continues ticking a little bit um, I think the range 2000 rpms that could be probably from a stationary diesel engine some uh, emergency uh, electricity generator thing i don't know maybe it's from a steamship maybe it's something completely different but uh, we want to look inside of course oh by the way there is a number a11 1233 I don't think you will find a lot about that I've seen a couple of them uh, for sale on uh, well the Swiss version of eBay it's called Ricardo and uh, well but that's everything you get that in different speed uh, ranges and stuff uh, first of all what does it do well, it measures the number of revolution per minute from whatever turns here. Or if you attach this to a wheel of a vehicle, of a car, of a, of a, of a train maybe, you could also measure the speed. You just have to adjust the scale here, realign uh, the numbers and stuff. So you can measure speed or revolution per minute or something like that. So how do you do that? One possibility is a counter like this one. It's from the same company, Hausler, in Bern. I think made in Switzerland. Yes, all good watches are made in Switzerland, of course. Hausler Bern. Bern is the capital city of Switzerland. And how this works is pretty simple. Let me adjust my screwdriver here. So that's the axle that's been turned. It has a, a grinded, a sharp point here, which is exactly centered. And you simply put it to anything that turns. Then you push like on a stopwatch, you push the button and after a defined uh, time, maybe I don't know, five seconds or so, uh, 
the needle shows you the amount of revolution. So we are below 1000, it's 550, 60, 70, yeah, 580. Okay, uh, oh, T, three, four, well, about five seconds. And we have a reset button here. So let's turn it a little bit faster. And we have 1200. It's the same result as with this one, this one. So that tells me that this device still works pretty good. Okay, so how is that working? We are turning the shaft here. Um, then we engage a timer and the clock hand here begins turning and stops after a defined time and we have the result. So it's counting a number of revolution in a specified time. By the way, I still have the original user manual for the for this uh, stopwatch clock. Stopwatch type uh, uh, revolution counter. Uh, it goes maximum to 10,000 per minute. There's a nice picture, an application measuring the RPM of an electric motor can be folded out. You can also use it to measure speeds, for example here on a big bandsaw. There is a, a wheel with a exactly defined uh, diameter and how do we call circumference. Uh, then there is a one revolution of the big uh, clock hand means 100 meter per minute with this adapter wheel here. And another nice thing is the remark here. So there are always on these old documents. So I would say it's from 1966. Probably it's from 1953, but I think 66. Well, that looks a little bit like 66. Okay. A much simpler way of measuring speeds or revolutions per minute is the eddy current uh, tachometer. And that works basically like this. You have a shaft that rotates. On this shaft you have a magnet. North, south or however. And over the magnet you have a bell-shaped uh, cover made of aluminium or copper, something not uh, non-magnetic material. And there is a second shaft, so let's call that the output shaft with an attached pointer. You have then a scale and there is a spring that prevents this shaft from rotating constantly. So, you may wonder how that works. This is a non-magnetic material. This is a magnet that spins around. How is that going? So, I prepared this for you. You know what this is, a heatsink, and that's a tiny magnet. And as you know, aluminium is not magnetic, so there is nothing happening with that magnet here, you see. But if I turn this here to a slope, something funny happens. The magnet slides down very slowly. I can put it almost uh, senkrecht. Sorry, I don't know that. No, no, it doesn't work. Okay, but you see something strange happens. Uh, 
if I take something made of wood, the same angle, you see that effect is not there, but it is there with the non-magnetic aluminium. Of course, if I take something magnetic like this screwdriver set, it wouldn't slide at all because it sticks to the magnetic uh, parts here. So a magnetic bell here wouldn't work. Now, what's happening is a magnet that moves inside a conducting uh, uh, thing always creates currents. So that's how a generator works. You have a magnet, you have a coil, maybe one, maybe a second, maybe a third and a fourth. And if you spin that around, we have an alternating magnetic field that induces magnetic fields inside these coils and that makes alternating currents inside the wires. Now here we don't have a wire, we have something that looks like that, Sorry, a bell shaped housing which is open on one side. Or we have this uh, aluminium sheet, this aluminium chunk here. Uh, there a uh, moving magnet also induces uh, currents. But these currents, if this is a cross section of this aluminium part, these currents will go inside like that or maybe like that, I'm not sure about that, so I have to consult the uh, old physics, physics books. Um, a current, I, uh, by the way, today we don't have any uh, disturbance from the church bells because we have an event here on, on the place, I will show you that, so you know where the music comes from. <laughs> Okay, where did I stop? With swirling currents, currents that are going around, so-called eddy currents. Um, and if a current goes around, we all know it creates a magnetic field. And here, maybe the same, maybe in another way. Well, I'm not sure about this, so it's a time ago that I had this in school, but well, you know what I mean. So, and now we have our magnet here, north, south. Sorry, should write. I should write right. Um, and one thing is sure: the currents or the magnetic fields inside the aluminium block are opposite to the magnetic field of the moving magnet, and that's the reason why they try to attract each other. But they can only attract each other as long the magnet moves, because if they attract too much, the magnet will stop, the current will stop, and there is no more magnetic field that could hold back the magnet. So it's a balance between slipping and stopping, and that's what you saw here. Okay, how does it work here? We have a rotating magnet, we have eddy currents here inside this bell and there is a certain force that is that goes from the magnet to the bell 
it wants to turn with the magnet, but it can't because of the spring. And the faster the magnet turns, the bigger the force on this non-magnetic bell here, the tighter the spring gets wind up and we have more RPMs or miles per hour or whatever you measure here. So that's pretty simple. You only need two uh, moving parts, one spring, needle, scale, that's it. This thing here is completely different. It is more like the stopwatch type, but it does everything automatically. It stops, it starts, it winds up, it resets all the time by itself. Let's look inside. And I can tell you this device comes from a time when real genius people made things. It's not like today where everything falls apart and must be thrown away just because it doesn't work anymore or it cannot be repaired. So we have one screw for the pointer that can be removed. Then the scale comes out like that. And now we have here one pin for making the scale here uh, fixed here on this position. But we have four notches here. So that means we can insert the scale like that. And because the pointer has a rectangular so, uh, fitting here, we can also sw uh, turn that 90 degrees and now we can make uh, mount the entire thing like that. Or if we want like that, somewhere under a machine or on a support arm or the other way, lo looking to the uh, left side, working exactly the same, the only Turn the scale and the pointer and everything works like before. It doesn't matter. So that is so in advance. You don't need four different models. You only have one model. You can convert it. Okay, and that's the inside. And it already looks like a Swiss clockwork because, well, it is a Swiss clockwork. But the cool stuff goes on. Let me switch to a bigger screwdriver. And now I can use that extension. I love it. Okay, we have one two three screws i think the screwdriver is too big or maybe my eyes are too really is it too big don't say that because the next smaller one is too small that's a bit the problem with these sets sometimes they have very funny steps in sizes Okay, let me see. Yeah, that works. One screw. Screw number two. Oh, sorry, I'm off cam. With a new song from the outside. We have free music today. Okay, and we simply lift out the entire mechanism. Now, before I show you the mechanism, I'll show you how it is mounted here. You see the screw, you see that little plate here that can turn 90 degrees. And it only turns 90 degrees because there is a pin 
and it is shaped exactly to fit that. Then here the same principle and here for some reason they took a, a bit a bigger plate. Maybe, I don't know, because of the spin. Uh, it doesn't matter which way that spins because the mechanism is made to work in either direction. So we have here in the shaft here are two ball bearings. Uh, not rectangular, uh, straight ball bearings, but those that are in an angle, you know, uh, radial uh, ball bearings or maybe, I don't know the name in English, I'm sorry. But there are two, they can be fit uh, to each other, so there is no axial play, absolutely no. We have greased gears here. There are more uh, ball bearings here and behind that wheel. They are a little bit complicated to take apart, or better, well, it's they are easy to take apart, but a little bit complicated to reinstall, so I won't do that now, but I can show you how they look. It's a bit unusual. There are, well, two, three types of ball bearings. Normal, uh, how can I draw that? Normal radial ball bearings, where the axle goes through that part. This part is inside the housing. Okay, a radial ball bearing. Then we have axial ball bearings that look like this, have balls all over the place and a second ring like that. A ring, of course. So the ring can spin. That ring, for example, is fixed. The uh, balls are in a groove here. And these are made to uh, take up forces like this, like uh, from this side or from that side. And they are named thrust bearings or radial bearings, while this one here is an axial bearing. Did I mix that up? Moment. Okay, again, this is radial and that is axial because it takes up the axial forces that are parallel to the axle. This takes up forces radially to the axle. And there is also a tapered, that's the word I was looking for, bearing that has roller be uh, balls here. And the inside looks like that. And of course that only works, for example, if a second bearing is installed that way on the same axle and the same shaft and they are bolted together with some force so that nothing can fall apart and of course with that construction you can remove any axial uh, play, free play. Yes, that's what they did here. And here, behind the gears, they have something special. They have a bearing that looks like that. That's the inner shaft. Or the inner sleeve with the groove where balls are going around. And then they have the outer part, which is slightly tapered like that, which also has a groove here. And you can take that apart. Oops, I'm sorry. You can take that apart and you can put it back and it will snap in slightly here. 
uh, it is a little bit of pain to uh, to reassemble because the inner ring here on the shaft will slide up and down so you have to figure out how to put it in so that's the reason why I do not uh, take that apart now and I will also not take apart this one because it's too complicated so I fear I will never get it back so that's the drive wheel that is driven by the big wheels behind uh, there is a funny detail there is a small funnel you can see that here that goes into a tube and that tube ends here on the shaft of the drive wheel because that's the fastest moving part here and where what is it good for uh, come on focus uh, if you put a drop of oil here it will go down the tube and lubricate this shaft here now how do you get a drop of oil inside this very easy there is an oiler cap you open that and you see a piece of string that's a wick you put some drops of very thin oil here that will run down this wick here and that piece of wick ends inside the funny funnel here and oils the input shaft the quick rotating input shaft here so I think alone this detail is it worth to look inside so what else can we see um, there is a mechanism here that switches the direction so if I turn that one in different directions this moves forth and back and causes this wheel here which is the one that drives the, the spring which is in this press uh, encasement here so if I put it forth and back you see that this wheel always turns in the same direction because different gears are engaging one is let me uh, take a pointer come on focus um, that's the drive wheel it is constantly in contact with this wheel here uh, if, we draw, if we rotate it to this side then that wheel goes directly to the next wheel here and if I rotate it it's a little bit difficult to get it here that uh, will be moved over and the, that's the wheel here that is driven directly by the input wheel connects to that wheel so we have one gear wheel more and that uh, changes the direction and makes that this wheel here is always turning in the same direction no matter which way I turn so that's an amazing detail okay we have here the clock uh, spring the for uh, in other words the power supply of this clock that is wound up as I turn and you can see here this notch here will move forward and the spring wheel will follow it and if I turn it too fast I mean if I turn that with 1000 rpms this spring here will 
uh, wind up completely and then it would probably break but this mechanism here uh, prevents that and it simply has a, a slipping mechanism let me see you can hear it now so I wind it up wind it up and now it's slipping so when the engagement pin here starts to move this this disc here the slipping mechanism is engaged and the spring cannot be overwound okay so that's the axle where the pointer is going and you see there is for example a lever that constantly opens and closes here to move maybe that's the reset then we have two more levers here i think that's some sort of the start and the stop lever you see they're constantly going up and down like the valve timing in a, in a car engine so start stop reset i don't know which is which so i haven't looked into mechanical things maybe i should do a slow-mo let me think about that okay that's getting a little bit difficult probably uh, i have here a slow-mo button that i have to press so Let's see if I can wind up that. Okay, I have to hold two wheels and a slow motion button on the camera in the same time. Let's try that. okay so let's put it back inside i think we have seen enough so there is another pin for the location of this clockwork i have to move these holding plates apart, uh, out of the way if it clicks in it doesn't move then i have to realign this uh, wick here that wicked wick that has to go into this funnel okay and then I simply close the plates here I should do it in the right direction on move over it's your turn okay let's start with that one that's going like that then the other one okay and why is the third one not working oh now it goes okay now it works we tighten that everything is in place reattach the scale pointer one screw and four more screws for the glass and the cover and we are done It's a bit difficult to see that black screw on a black background. Okay, not over tighten that. Okay, it still works. The faster I turn, 
Okay, I think that's it. Thanks for watching.